also doing a special series of looking at the uh, 15 years of ITA Doc Lab. Um, so, and today we have William Urukio. So, William, maybe you could go ahead and just uh, introduce yourself and tell me a bit about what you do in the realm of immersive media. Sure. So, I'm a professor at MIT, professor of comparative media studies, and about 10 years ago started uh, MIT's Open Documentary Lab. So, it's a lab in, in a certain way, academic counterpart to the work of ITFA. Um, we look a lot at emerging technologies and what their implications are for the for the work of documentary. And I was going to say documentary storytelling, but that's not quite right because even the notion of storytelling is up for grabs uh, with some of these new technologies. Um, about five years ago, we started the co-creation studio, which looks a lot at methodologies of creation. How do these new technologies um, help us to rethink notions of authorship and agency and making? So we look both at the technology side of emerging media and documentary and at the creative side through these two different labs. Awesome. And, and maybe you could give a bit more context as to your background and your journey into this space. Sure. So I started life kind of as a philosopher slash historian. That's my academic pedigrees. And um, uh, my background is actually in film history. And I did my dissertation many moons ago on uh, the first uh, 10 or 13 years of of nonfiction in cinema. It's an area that tends that most cinema historians tend have tended to ignore in terms of nonfiction. There's a lot of work on fiction and the emergence of slow emergence of a of a of a storytelling vocabulary. But nonfiction was kind of written off as as naive um, somehow. I don't get it, but that's what happened. I think it's because a lot of the early uh, nonfiction films, whether of factories or of cities, I focused on cities, tend to just be tracking shots or static shots or a vertical tilt. That's the film. And um, it, I, you sort of can get why that's considered considered naive. From my perspective, I tried to locate it not so much as the beginning of a new medium, but rather the culmination of a series of earlier media practices. So the panorama, for example, which is akin to the to the pan or um, naturally uh, um, still photography, whatever. So this, the stereoscope with its penetration of depth. Um, so a lot of my work was, it turned out to in fact be in historical terms, very much about emerging media and what they had to do with the ways in which people look at the world. Why nonfiction is because nonfiction is very often a site of, um, I think it's like the R and D lab for the film industry generally for color films, for sound films, um, first moving camera, all that stuff is happening in nonfiction before as, as nonfiction kind of works out the protocols and then the fiction world picks it up. That's my theory anyway. So that's where we are today. A lot of emerging technologies and um, documentary is kind of parsing them, feeling them out. I think what works or what the conventions are, those will eventually be picked up by uh, by the fiction world. Yeah, that's really quite interesting because there has yeah. been quite a number of, say, 360 videos uh, in the VR sphere, which is probably similarly ignored in the sense of you know, not really having great distribution options or um, really as, you know, exalted as something as like the, the video games or some of the other fiction pieces that have seen a lot broader distribution. Um, before we dive into some of the aspects of, you know, what's happening with these new immersive tech, I'm just very curious from a historical perspective. I've heard about the cinema of attractions as being a big part of the early phases of film. And so do you think that the documentary was actually happening maybe even before or at the same time as that phase of that's commonly referred to as the cinema of attractions for film? Yeah. So Tom Gunning picks up the term from, uh, he picked up the term cinema of attractions from Eisenstein, in fact. Um, and it, I think it pertains, you know, there's the, the sort of a tension between the two, two poles, you might say, in this period. And one is very much about the theatrical and the telling of a story in a staged manner, ref referring back to the dominant modalities of, of storytelling in the, on the stage. But the other was sort of using cinema to generate an experience of being there, of, of, of you might, akin to a roller coaster ride, right? Where there's, where sensation is the key thing. And I, I do think that a lot of the early nonfiction um, evoked that uh, by putting you somewhere where you weren't by, and especially and that accounts, I think, in part for some of these um, strange, the, the strange absence of editing in some of these films, right? That it's a three minute track down a street uh, or a five minute track down a street. Uh, that sense of being there is very akin that, that the sensation, I think, is evoked in that. So it's not 
again, you know, it's easy to call that naive, but one might also sort of see it as if you've ever been to one of those amusement park rides where um, you're in a little booth and it's kind of has legs, you're going up and down in the thing and you're watching a roller coaster ride or a helicopter ride, you're inside the, the vehicle. Any break in that, any, any, whenever the film breaks and they tape it back together, those are terrifying moments. Uh, there's a kind of epistemological vertigo that occurs. And I think it would have been very similar in the early days, uh, these early days of film. The sensation of being somewhere um, is, I think, you know, I, I never never spoke to Tom about this, but I, I suspect it would fit easily within the cinema of attractions. And we're certainly back there today with, three, with a lot of 360 use, um, mm. for sure. Yeah. But I think, again, you know, you can see that tension quite strongly in, in 360 between folks who are trying to tell a story and direct your attention and maybe win a little sensation as well. But the whole endeavor is to take 360 space and, in fact, get you to focus somewhere, as opposed to those folks who use 360 as a site of exploration, to let you explore 360 in its richness. One of them is trying to make 360 like a movie, but with something behind you. The other is trying to find a way to let 360 be 360. Um, mm. It's an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting moment as we try to work out these protocols. Awesome. And, yeah, and, and maybe you could give a bit more context as the, what was the catalyst for the beginning of the MIT Doc Lab, or if that was the origin point for you, or if it came out of something else. So maybe you could take us back to when sure. when that started and what was the catalyst for that? Sure. So I would, you know, my department at MIT, Comparative Media Studies, is a, is a media studies program with a twist. And the two twists actually one and one of the twists is that rather than being a media studies program that looks at the silos of media that dives deep into film or television or new so-called new media games or whatever we've really always kind of looked across them like what can we learn by looking across different media forms what are their uh, what do they share in terms of what moments of introduction the kinds of anxiety narratives that they introduce in society People love them and then hate them. And that seems common to all of them. Like, what can we learn by comparing these media forms? Not just in terms of historical development, but what can we learn by comparing them, for example, across cultural usage? Cell phone is used in very different ways in rural Kenya than it is in downtown Manhattan. And what can we learn from those differences? What can we learn by putting different kinds of theoretical frames or using different methodologies to assess them? And that's qu that's quite different from most media studies programs, which tend to embrace one or two media forms and one or two sets of methods and one or two perspectives. So anyway, that's been MIT's little twist on it. And the second twist and the relevant one for our conversation is that um, MIT is fairly technologically oriented place. It's a lab culture. And we thought, you know, we should do this as a lab. We should think about like how we can how we can test our thinking about media by applying it. And so we've always had a you know somewhere between six and and ten different labs, a games lab that's sort of looking at the frontiers of technology, but also in terms of the notion of the ludic and the playable. Um, a lab that looks at civic media and how we might deploy media in civic settings as ways of enhancing agency for regular folks and aggregating, you know, whatever. So in that spirit, um, as, a, as someone with a, a long and abiding interest in documentary, I started the Open Doc Lab. And it came about because MIT has a rich tradition in, doc, in, in media generally. Technicolor comes, it's the tech and Media Institute of Technology. Technicolor starts way back in 1919 at MIT, but up through folks like Ricky Leacock, uh, who started the film unit in what is now the Media Lab. Uh, Ricky Leacock, probably best known as one of the key driving forces behind direct cinema, uh, using 16 millimeter cameras to get out there and observe the world. Um, that took place in the very building where I work. And Gloriana Davenport worked there, one of the the, the, the the, the patron of interactive cinema with her media fabrics group using all the like, rules full of technology to sort of build these interactive cinema environments. So we really looked at that legacy and combined it with MIT's commitment to openness, open source software and open courseware, trying to make things available to the public and just put, you know, sat in the middle of that little triangle between Ricky's work with innovative uses of technology for documentary, Gloriana's with interaction and the openness. 
and said, what are we doing at a moment where all of us have high definition cameras in our pockets? Like, what does this mean for documentary when all of us have the capacity to, to see and to record and to make things? Software is accessible. Distribution platform is accessible through the internet. We all have the cameras in our pockets. Does this hearken a kind of new era of documentary, or at least the potential for that? So that got us looking at nascent forms about a decade ago. So there was a lot of interactive stuff online. There is a shift in who makes these things because there are a lot of regular folks can now make document the world around them. What do we do with the YouTube and it's 300 plus hours uploaded per minute uh, of, of video content? Like, how do we think about that from a documentary lens? So really, it's been about trying to understand uh, you know, we provoked by all these media changes and accessibility and new new kinds of affordance and new kinds of agency, what does it mean for that old project of trying to see the world as the world, trying to represent the real in the world, and trying to get other folks to see it the way that you see it? So that's where the lab started. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you said about a, a decade ago, and I know that the Oculus Kickstarter is like August of 2012. So you're talking around 2000 and. 10, 2011 then when uh, Doc Lab started? I guess we are, yeah. It's, I, I don't know the exact date when we started. It was, you know, it was kind of bubbling for a while, but the formal start, I think we're at our 10th anniversary right now. So yeah, it must okay. be 11. Okay. Yeah, and the Doc Lab's at the 15th year anniversary. So when did you first come across the Doc Lab then? Well, I came across Casper first, actually, in the classroom in Utrecht, where I was a professor and he was a student and uh, it was the beginning of a beautiful friendship and i and even then when i was so i used to be a professor at utrecht university in the netherlands starting in 93 and kind of helped give birth to the media side of that of that uh what was uh soon to be named the department of theater film and television studies and anyway as as one of the one of the two media professors in the netherlands it was a new pretty new field in the netherlands um of course, I knew about IDFA and was soon invited to be on the jury of reg regular IDFA. Ali Dierks and the, the the women who ran IDFA, in fact, were all from Utrecht University. That was their that was their background. So I knew about that festival, you know, from my from the start of my 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 arrival in the Netherlands, um, and was a, I've been a regular there for forever. But the Doc Lab was a really important development. I mean, a really, to my mind, a really crucial development in the. Uh, in the space of thinking about where new technologies meet old traditions, meet meet um, meet established ways of, of 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 thinking and seeing, yeah. So that's right from the start. Yeah. Well, with your background in both philosophy and comparative media theory, and you know, looking at the early days of film, and as we start to look at these immersive technologies and what's happening just broadly within documentary across all the media. Do you have any like favorite uh, theoretical frameworks that help you orient yourself towards each of these medias? Because you know it's really a combination of of you know video games and theater and film and aspects of the internet and human computer interaction. And so, um, are there any existing folks or ways that you've uh, found that help you either understand the affordances of each of those media or um, specifically for each of those media, if you're taking insights from those and then kind of adding them to, you know, this broader XR immersive technologies as we start to try to make sense of this whole space? I mean, that's a really good question and a, and a difficult one to answer. And I'm, I'm going to get off the hook by giving you an analogy. Um, what's the right way to cut open an orange? You know, there's a lot of, they cut it across the horizon and it reveals a bunch of little triangles. You can cut it from endpoint to endpoint and see a bunch of curved sections. You can just squeeze it and get a bunch of juice. You can, you know, do, there's a lot of ways to analyze the structure of that thing. And each one reveals something, but no one reveals the kind of full workings of the of of of, of the of the orange. And I, I think about theory that way a lot, that there are there are <laughs> there are a lot of theories out there. And um and each, you know, each reasonable theory probably has a pretty, pretty good, pretty strong affordance, a pretty, a pretty um, a distinct use value. But, but I'm really fond of using a bunch, like a couple of different ones, uh, to try to, in a certain sense, triangulate what what in fact is happening. Each one reveals something, but occludes a lot more than it reveals. 
So I tend to to be a little agnostic on the theory front um, and really do think about using multiple. So I, so history is one I, I, I turn to religiously. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned from precedent. Um, so there are folks who have theorized that. Bolter and Grusin have a notion of remediation where they argue that each new media form is kind of starts off by trying to replicate an earlier media form. Well, that's a useful insight and a, and a very helpful one. Doesn't explain everything, but it's a but it's a great way to to sort of crack it open. Um, so I guess yeah, that would be my answer. That there's a, that it's more about the number of theories I deploy than which theories. And 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 any bunch are always going to yield something kind of interesting in the spaces in between. That said, you know what what's exciting uh, about some of the newer media forms we have. It's something people have said, I think, with the with the introduction of every new media form. But I think there is something a little different with our current ones. And that has to do with their recursive character. There's a way in which um, really the first, you know, if you think of our media regime as something that starts in the 15th century, like Gutenberg's book, but also Three Point Perspective, those those two phenomena are about 30 years apart in the uh, 1430s to 1460, somewhere in that in that window. Those what those things do is is amplify a difference between the subject and the object, between the speaker and the world, huh? the, the, between the viewer and the world. In the case of three point perspective, or in the case of the book, you know, the author and however many copies, it's it's a very much about an amplifier of the self. And all of our media have done that: radio, television, film, uh, print. Until now, and I think where we are now is there's like a little twist. And it's not always very visible, but the twist in the new stuff is the recursive character that now suddenly, if you think of the way social media work or uh, or the way VR, uh, 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 um, um, real-time VR works, actually, you're, we, we think we're a subject and we think we see the world, but there's actually something curating what's in between. We don't see everything that people are sending to us on Facebook. We see a mix. And that mix is constantly being curated to extend our length of stay, to ex to in intensify our engagement. We think we're seeing what's out there, but we're seeing something that's being cooked. And what's being cooked is being cooked somewhere between the needs of the system designer and our own behaviors. And we're seeing that more and more. I think this is a we're starting to see this. I, I mean, something like Notes on Blindness, which is a beautiful, a beautiful VR piece. I wasn't aware until I talked to the makers that actually it's responsive to how users use it. If you just put on the headset and sit still, it's a relatively quick experience. If you put on the headset and look around and kind of explore the space, it slows down, it slows down the unfolding of the narrative, it takes longer. The system is responding to you, but it's responding to you based on certain assumptions that, that movement implies interest. That uh... So anyway, I think that, that moment, that recursivity that's starting to occur in new media forms is deeply fascinating and something that has enormous potential for good and for ill. Um, uh, as we're starting to learn, but, but um, that is different from anything we've seen from the 15th century. So, so while it's, you know, while every new media medium has been, has been greeted with like claims of radical, radical difference in newness, I think for the first time, actually, it's kind of, I could make a pretty strong case for it, I think now. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Oops. I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Um, um, so hold so, on. Is, hold on. Uh, maybe you could um, mute on your side just for a second, because I'm hearing some feedback for some reason. <clears throat> Okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so I guess the thing that that comes to mind for oh, hold on, I'm still getting. Can, I'm still is there getting, a way that you can, mute, you can your, mute your your microphone, William? Uh yeah, There's I can mute my microphone. Testing. Let's see. It's up the right hand corner. Okay, that's better. Okay. Um, so yeah, the the thing that comes to mind is as you say all that is like the girdle incompleteness nature of like you can't you know for any system it's not going to be complete. Um, there's so it sort of leads to this pluralism to be able to look at a wide range of different types of approaches. And so I've I guess I've taken a similar approach for me and um, also look at different you know a, a, a primary fundamental aspects of like there's the 
sort of the dialectic and uh, polarities that are happening with the tension and, and contrast and uh, but also uh, piercy and semiotics and a triadic approach when you start to uh, interpret some of these different uh, media and um, or tri uh, tetradic or if you look at the sort of elements and for me I use the sort of classic or the ancient philosophy of looking at different aspects of the elements and looking at active presence and mental and social presence and emotional presence and embodied environmental presence um, as metaphors. Uh, but I think there's also a big part of context of how um, as you immerse into these places, you see context in a way that goes above and beyond how we are able to communicate context within the, the 2D media or other forms. And so how there's this kind of way of nesting context um, from, I guess, uh, Whitehead and his concepts of Mariology and holes and parts. So you're able to kind of have fractal nesting within the context of media. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess as I as I look out, I'm, I'm curious for your perspective, as you start to look back at some of maybe the the philosophical primitives of if there's other philosophers that have um, talked about certain aspects of whether it's like the Hegelian dialectic of, as applied to perception or um, other other things that you may be looking to in terms of helping to understand um, not only the the human and human consciousness and philosophy of mind, but also relative to uh, the world around you as we talk about media per, uh, specifically, if you feel like there's uh, looking back into uh, more primitive aspects uh, from other philosophers to see how they uh, might be able to be applied. For me, I, I, I get a lot of inspiration from Whitehead and process philosophy, but I'm curious if there's other philosophers or other insights you get uh, when we start to look at, you know, understanding this media. Yeah, well, I've been, you know, it's 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 funny. So I cut my teeth, as I said, on on film. But one of the first, you know, stepping out of graduate school, got a Fulbright, went to Germany, looking at early nonfiction in the, the Germans are great taxonomizers of, uh, uh, so they had just, there's wonderful and rich discourse. And we're talking here pre, pre World War One, wonderful and rich discourse on nonfiction. But anyway, as, as I was in the archive, I kept stumbling across stuff on Fanzan, on television. I was like, eh, what the, heck? how can this even be? Like I, everything I knew was kind of post World War II for TV, started collecting, uh, started collecting stuff. Anyway, I became, turned out I became a historian of very early television, 19th century and early 20th century television. And what, what really hit me was how both the, the question and the difference. So we often tend to conflate those two technologies a bit. We know one's electronic, but somehow television is just kind of a new distribution system for the cinematic and the film came first, we think, and actually it didn't, TV was first. But actually the difference between them clarified the moment I started thinking about the pre-Socratics and, and the ways in which someone like, um, you know, you have Parmenides and his notion of, 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 of continuity and like, well, what's, how does television work? How does pre-digital TV work? It's a scan line. It's a scan line that never stops. Um, and just goes across the raster, but it, it's really a point why Rudolf Arnheim doesn't talks about film as art and radio as art, but never talks, even though he writes an essay on TV and a good essay on, t on television in 1935, never, it never breathes the word art. And it's because it was information poor from his perspective. That little dot not only creates the illusion of an image, but it does it fast enough and often enough that it creates the illusion of the moving image. Whereas at least film starts with an image before it plays the trick on you. So it was information thin, but from my perspective, like, hey, this is Parmenides, like this is flow, pure flow. And if you think of Democritus and the atomists, well, what's film? Like it's it's proof that it works, right? It's this series of little atom atoms, these little, these little images that are all still, but coming at you fast enough, create the illusion of something actually there and moving, like just as atoms for all their dynamism and whatever, create the illusion of solidity and, and presence. So that that's always struck, that was a very clarifying moment for me, kind of thinking about these two pre-Socratic traditions that just hit on the head, kind of the fundamental difference between those two media forms. Um, I'm a Hegelian at heart, I will admit, with a soft spot for, for Peirce and try it, you know, tingle my soul. So anything I can do to kind of jump between two positions and find a third way out is something I, 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 I think I do as just a default way of thinking. That's, that's for sure. 
Yeah, I know that Hegel's approach towards history of, of looking at the you know dialectics and the thesis, antithesis and synthesis, I think has been also a really helpful way of also thinking about um, these things. And as we come into the synthesis of whatever these immersive technologies are, I'm, I'm curious if we, we can maybe turn to um, you know that process of you know as we've looked at this you know evolution of the media. I think Doc Lab has been you know a key part of you know, both featuring different works, but also creating and cultivating a community for those creators to be able to interact with each other and to have a platform for experimentation that I think has been a pretty key part of the of this, you know, area as well. And I'm curious at what point you decided to take the next step with Doc Lab to be able to, to form this uh, additional partnership. And maybe you could just speak more about that. And what was the catalyst for that coming about? Yeah. So, 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 a just to amplify what you said. I mean, I think it's so, so right that what makes what makes it Doc Lab so special is um, that it, it was not, it was never just a showcase for for new projects. It it does that, of course, but it's always been about the community and and the conversation, and that's something I really loved about it. And it's funny to watch, like in the wake, it's that's fifteen years, but let's say in the last five or so years, there there have been a flurry of uh, festivals starting labs and starting, you know kind of formalizing the stuff that that was organic and intrinsic to Infos Doc Lab from the get-go, that community part, that in a way, that research part, drawing folks together to kind of think about pr the process and practice and technique, that's been really valuable. And of course, universities do that by default. That's kind of our core, our core business. So it seemed like a, and given our stance at MIT, which is like that kind of core research business, but always with a an attempt to, to apply it or to find, to test it in, in the world, it just seemed like a ready-made partnership. And, and it was great, you know, it was great that I knew Casper and it was great that Casper knew about our work. Uh, I knew about his work and it just, it just was a hand in glove kind of fit. It, it, it really worked well. Um, I think, you know, obviously we spend a lot, a lot more time like all year doing doing research and we're not the, the 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 power one of the great powers of a festival is its status as an event a time-bound event which kind of forces makers to to meet a deadline to kind of do that final push to get it in unlike the academic world where there's never there are deadlines but like it, basically we kind of keep on roll and um so i think that that disjunctive temporality has actually been good too. We can kind of continue to mull things over in our own slow academic pace where the festival is a kind of a punctuation mark where it has to like stop or start or, or, uh, or, or pay off. Um, yeah, sorry. I forgot the, I forgot where I was oh, going uh, with this. With, so yeah. What was the, what was the name of the, the thing again that you created with the doc lab and maybe talk about like what the intent and purpose of, of this sort of collaboration that you're doing with them and, um, you know, what, what, what the goal of it is. Yeah. So, so I, you know, what's so important about research in this sector is that, um, the research is happening as much with the makers as it is happening with, with folks like me in the, in the, in the Academy. And I say this like, and I, I think back to, um, Lev Kuleshov and, you know, the experiment, we all know the, 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 um, experiment where he he uh, uh, Pudovkin says this I don't know I don't know it I only know it through Pudovkin who says you know he intercuts this footage of a of a face with a with a uh, with a with a coffin and a face with an empty cupboard and a face with a girl and the face is always the same face the same actress face uh, the same non expressive face and people read this and scribe emotion to it this is the the birth in a way of the the theories of montage. And what's compelling about this this anecdote is that it took place in the world's first film school. The Moscow Film School was the world's first, and and it really shows how, with a nascent technology, film was relatively new by that point. You know, thirty years old, maybe uh, twenty five years old. Um, it was this. These are some of the first systematic steps to instead of copying what was happening on the film stage or doing what photographic or stereos stereoscopic practice were doing with the street scenes that I looked at so much. This was really an endeavor to experiment with the medium, a new medium, and to try to invent and find um, a language for it and a set of, a set of, a set of uh, cap explore its capacities and come up with kind of some, some practices. So I really, I really take that to heart. And I think a lot of our work with, uh, with Open Doc Lab, 
uh, sorry, with uh, a lot of our work with InfoDoc Lab, our work at the OpenDoc Lab has been really about that, about looking at this new stuff and saying, well, what what kind of taxonomy are we going to use? Are we going to use a language that derives from like film and television? Is that the are those the right concepts to use, or should we take concepts from from computer science? Should we take concepts from immersive theater? What what descriptors, what categories, what language should we even use? That's a that's a fairly important question. And and of course, as these things these things are also nascent, that they're inscribed with all of those languages and all of those concepts depending on which reviewer you read or which essay you read. So our job has, to been, has been to kind of reflect on that and figure out is there a, what are the affordances of each of these approaches? Um, you know, the, the problem shows up in a very tangible way with like, well, how do you fund something that's really new, like a, a new technique or a new technology? Does that fit into the film funding? You know, there's always these guidelines and boxes when, when money is at stake. Well, is it a film or is it television or is it theater? Well, actually, it's something else. Well, we don't have a box for something else, you know, unless it's the new media art. Uh, is it new media art? And of course, that's drives a lot of people into that discursive domain to try to get the funding to continue the work. But it's something that's really important because why those boxes are there is because they have well-established criteria, right? There's 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 a value. There's a, ways of assessing whether something is good or not so good, interesting or not so interesting. But in a box called the new, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of criteria, so funders tend to shy away from it. So we've been really trying to look at that process, understand it, and find ways to help emergent forms kind of fit into a system where they're able to be funded, where there is where there can be a critical discourse, where multiple parties can look at this and have a kind of common discursive platform, so they can. <laughs> exchange ideas in a meaningful in a meaningful way i think that's that's the the, the part of that's the place in the ecosystem that we inhabit uh we we try to be an enabler we try to find a way to take these new unruly things and not so much force them into pre-existing boxes which is to deny their newness and deny their 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 innovative potentials but rather you know, really make that stuff evident, but in a way that people can talk about and assess and hopefully fund. Yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, this interactive component of the documentaries, because when I when I first went to Doc Lab, I was seeing works that I've seen other pieces out and, you know, these kind of interactive explorations. And, you know, there was the, uh, you know, anagram groups, the collider was a piece that I saw that was particularly striking in terms of the type of interactivity that you have with kind of acting out this psychodrama with two people. And when I think about documentary, it was sort of that was an experience that I didn't automatically think of as like documentary form. But as we think about this, you know, reflections of different um, things that are happening in, in reality and kind of, you know, how, how we define documentary, but also this uh, I guess concepts of potential of a lot of times the linear media doesn't have those aspects of potential. It's just the, the things that have been actualized by the maker and it's very authored, but there's kind of a shared authorship um, for more of the video games. You talk about the generative media or agency or interactivity. And I, for me, philosophically, I think of it in terms of potential and potential and how that there's a, a range of possibilities uh, from like quantum ontology there's a, a something that goes from the potential into the actual through the context of measurement, um, you know, the measurement problem, or just in, in terms of these, you know, deeper archetypal realms of, you know, a whitehead had these concepts of, of the eternal objects or Platonism for, you know, these realms of, of ideal forms that are somehow you know, coming into actuality. But, you know, this translation from the potential to actuality is something that is, I think, unique into the interactive and participatory aspects of the media that I guess, you know, when you talk about documentary as documenting something that's already happened versus something that's emerging in the moment that you're actively participating in the expression of maybe just determining different aspects of your own character by putting by uh, being put into that context and making choices and taking action. Um, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, these blending of forms of this interactivity uh, with the documentary and how you start to kind of conceptually think about some of these things. 
Yeah, so that's that's a really rich that's a really rich area, and and I would say the the key the key factor here is agency. Where where is agency, and how does how does agency operate? What are its what are its contours and its uh, potentials? Indeed, um, we're shi- we have been shifting from a from you know, our media forms have been shifting from a kind of center to periphery model to something else. We've always had that something else correspondence when, when the telephone emerges there's that was always something else but but our mainstream media have always been centered to periphery there have been authorities there the agency has been centralized and it's been kind of parsing the world for us on our behalf um and and the rise of of uh, the, let's say circa 1990 and the kind of emergence in popular in the popular world of, of computation uh, pcs um started to enable a, a, the internet and World Wide Web and all that start to enable a, a different kind of of interactions, amplifying perhaps what what's already there with post and the telephone, but like doing it at scale and doing it robustly. And with that, it's, it's also interesting that that coincides with the kind of deregulation in the U.S. and some European countries in television, the rise of cable in the mid '80s. Right, there's a, a series of shifts that start to weaken that center to periphery clarity. Um, and with that kind comes a kind of it's accompanied by things like post-structuralism, which are starting to sort of get away from the master narrative and challenge that a little bit. That's happened a decade or two earlier. It's prescient. Uh, games are really a great manifestation of it. Always have been, but once again, they're at scale, and once they're social rather than two players, it's it, once you're talking about a, a much larger social scale. It's a really interesting really interesting stuff starts to happen in terms of the power of the individual, the user to actually start to not just interpret a system differently, but actually construct a text differently um, to make choices within a textual system. Yeah. We have people like Julio Cortazar and Hopscotch where you can, you know, you're encouraged to jump around in the book that that's happened with the book. Yeah. We have, uh, Chelsea Girls Warhol's film where the projectionist can kind of figure out which of two soundtracks to flip us between. We've had forms of interaction before, but this really does it at scale and does it intensively. And I don't think we've really reconciled where we are with that. We're kind of caught between the a long term, and I mean, you know, centuries long term notion of like what a what a narration is or what a story is. And we're entering a world where something quite different is at hand. And there are one of two ways to look at this. You can look at it as, like I just said it, it sounds new, like, oh, we're entering this new space. What are we going to do? Or you can kind of reassess where we've been and say, actually, we've always had some of these other forms. So so a, a, a example I would, I've, I've used in, in stuff I've written is um, Disney. You know, Disney is, is, is a, the Disney company and the Disney project is a really interesting one really early proponents of transmedia, for example. Mickey is on the screen, but Mickey's on records and Mickey's in comic books. And, you know, that was happening, I don't know, 40s, maybe 30s. It it happened. It's been happening for a while. But maybe more interesting from like where we are today with a, a, a technology like VR or interactive, you can buy Bambi and you have a linear traditional story beginnings and ends and you have to read it more or less in sequence or you can go to disneyland and you can wander down any path you want you can go left i can go right we're all going to come out with a disney branded experience we're all going to put together a series of experience experiential dots and have our story to tell at the end of the day around the campfire uh but it's completely interactive and it's completely immersive and it's completely different for all of us and yet we come out with a lot of the same messaging and branding and that space to me is very akin to what one might find in an interactive uh, online project or a, a 360 immersive uh, experience where you can be looking one way and I can look the other. And yet at the end of the day, we we're kind of assembling a world. So while a lot of this stuff seems really new, in fact, and, and you know, actually Carlo Ginsburg, the um, Italian cultural theorist has written eloquently about um about the the roots of narrative and what he calls the venatic tradition. So hunting, the hunter goes through a world and sees sees bits of fur and footprints and can construct a whole narrative from that. Right? This is an aging female that's on its way for water or whatever. And um, 
and he, he says, he, he qualifies it and says it's a very daring hypothesis. But I think, yeah, it's a very useful hypothesis to, to, to think about in terms of where we are with this, in this so-called new world of interactivity. It's always been there. It's just differently technologized. Uh, but it helps us to sort of step away from the, the dominance of, of that center to periphery fixed uh, textual system that our cultures have sort of thrived on for hundreds of years and kind of reassess what's kind of always been there in the cracks and underneath. It's, you know, we do a lot of work in my lab, but we, in the co-creation studio, it's what it's all about. Co-creation seems like something that's kind of new and emergent, but it's deeply embedded in our culture. It gets overwritten with the rise of copyright and the rise of the author that coincides with, you know, the, the, the 18th century, 17th, late 17th century invention of authorship as intellectual property. We need the author in order to protect, but look back at Rembrandt or, or you know, look, uh, Rodin, these are always collaborative efforts. These are studio efforts that get branded under one name and for legal reasons, ultimately, for financial reasons. So looking at something like co-creation today allows us to look back through the past and discover, actually, it's always been there. We write it off as folk culture. We demean it as amateurism. But in fact, it's a, it's a very basic way that we that we have always created. So to me, that's the power of a lot of the new media, that it helps us to to kind of reassess older practices that we kind of didn't think about, that weren't so visible to us or we didn't really think about, and learn from those and see what elements of that we can broker into, you know, to help clarify our, our understanding of the present and, and future, of course. Yeah, one one uh, way that I orient, orient myself around some of these questions is that, you know, famous Robert McKee quote where he uh, a Robert McGee quote where he's talking about how there's uh, in the process of telling stories is you put these characters within a certain situation and context and when they're put under pressure they're making choices and the types of choices they make under pressure is revealing of their character and the more intense of that context is that the more you get to their essential character of who they are. And I think in authored media, we're watching other people make those choices uh, and we're seeing them and that, how that's revealing their character in the context of that situation. But yet, I think we're moving into this realm where us as uh, the interactors and participants with this media are being put into these contexts and these situations and we have to make those choices. And those choices, uh, it may be contextually dependent or there could be certain aspects of those choices that are revealing certain aspects of our essential character, which I think is kind of an interesting switch from you know, the typical ways we've thought about narrative when we turn this into more of, say, the depth psychological approach where, you know, kind of a, a Jungian, you're being put into this psychodrama that is a, a allowing you to kind of like tap in and reveal certain aspects of who you are. And so you walk out of this experience, maybe understanding more about yourself, which I think is maybe right. different than what we've seen in other, you know, media in the past that, uh, I mean, to a certain extent, maybe video games are starting to do that. But I think with the documentary and everything else with the immersive media, it seems to be amplified more. Um, so I'm just curious to hear your thoughts of how you orient sort of documentary into this idea that we're going into these uh, pieces and maybe learning more about our own essential character. Well, you know, I think it's Kate Nash who talks about this, this turn, this new turn in documentary as being relational. That it, really this is, instead of presentational, instead of presenting us with the world, this is really relational. It's kind of, ex it's exploring the space between us and the world we inhabit. And I think that, the, you know, the, the, the summation you just gave is a really, is, is pretty eloquent about, about what that difference is from us having, sitting back and, and being presented with the authoritative take on things to now us being part of the process and being able to reflect on what our part in that process is. I think a well-crafted interactive documentary will always will always enable us will will always present the user with a bit of a mirror to be able to assess the choices they've made in interacting with their stance within that world. That needs to be something the user is aware of. If it's just a a novelty, if it's just like oh you can go left or right and you'll see different things, but so what? seems to me to be a lesser use of the medium for, for nonfiction purposes than helping the user to, to really think about their relatedness, their, their situatedness in something. So, um, you know, it's not, obviously it's not a form that's for every documentary, for every topic, but those scenarios that will benefit from the user being, a, making, having, exercising agency and being aware of kind of the, the logics that motivate that agency, that's, that's real power, I think. 
Um, so I think, you know, obviously we're very, we're still at early days. Some projects do it quite well. Some projects, some projects use the trappings, but don't actually get at the essence. And I do think we're very much caught between two worlds where you see this, uh, the VR is the, is the space where this is most clear, where we're coming from a world of well-crafted, well-authored stories and folks who, who do that well want to explore a new medium and want to tell a great story and, versus people who who and maybe it's just where you're coming from if you're coming from immersive theater chances are you're going to make a far more interesting vr space because you're thinking about it as a space where the user can be empowered to explore and and discover and connect dots versus i have a bunch of dots i want you to connect and i'm going to use little audio cues and visual cues to get you to see my dots and follow my story that's a anyway my only point here is to say we're at a moment where both of those both of those discourses are there. We're kind of the old way of doing it, ported, you know, the the new wine and old bottle thing, and the. Uh, but there are folks, more and more examples of people like really finding the potentials of these technologies, enabling the user to to actually think a bit about their own agency and and see the patterns that they've been pursuing. I mean, a. a, a um, um, even a project like Do Not Track was really wonderful, eloquent in the way it just kind of did a little flip so that you suddenly were seeing yourself in, in the documentary and becoming aware of your own behaviors as part of the part of the project that was being documented. It did it in, a, I don't want to say a traditional way, a, a, but a very easy to sort of swallow way, did not, nothing radical or uh, about the form, and yet really subversive in terms of how it enabled us to see, how, you, how it enables individuals to see themselves. Um, so yeah, I think I think that shift in agency and the capabilities of agency and the awareness of agency that's that's really what's what's at stake and what's what's you know when it's done right really really is a, is is added value of these of these new forms. Yeah, it's it's interesting to to hear the the relational connection there because I I take it back to Whitehead and his process relational metaphysics that, you know, he has a metaphysical a approach to saying like all of the nature of reality could be described in terms of relationships and processes they're unfolding in these nested contexts as that are, that are, are kind of, um, meteorologically nested in these holes and parts. And, you know, when, when I think about perception or embodied cognition or these ideas of context, they're all kind of going back to these aspects of relationality, but relationality is in, in everything from indigenous philosophy and Chinese philosophy and, yeah. you know, these Heraclitus and, um, Schelling and, and Hegel and, you know, Whitehead is, is kind of connected to the, you know, Pierce is also very process relational to and then, I mean, you can go back and kind of look at the evolution of this, uh, dynamic flux and how there it's more about these things and rather than the substance metaphysics, that would be these static concrete objects that have properties. It's more about how there's this underlying core of dynamic flux of processes and relationships that are unfolding and whether or not you go down to the metaphysical level uh, or not, I do think that there's something about process in time and how time unfolds and the qualities of time that are there um, that are kind of, you know, there's a lot of insights that I uh, in, uh, draw from personally when I look at the more process relational approach, uh, you know, starting with Whitehead, but going back into Heraclitus and other process relational thinkers over time. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, kind of this process relational turn. And if you feel like experiential design, as well as, you know, other aspects of this media uh, uh, could be benefiting from taking that more relational approach. Well, so A, I think it's intrinsically relational. The, the question is what, what, how we unpack it. And, and I think what you've offered is a really wonderful way to sort of, you've offered a, a philosophical through line of folks who've been engaged in this endeavor philosophically. And I think these are projects that really, and I think that is, one could probably point to some some earlier uh, artistic practices that do this, but I think for the first time we have a we're working with systems that are built to 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 you know again Kate, to echo Kate Nash that are built in relational terms. I mean it's it, it's intrinsic in the operation of these systems. You can't be a passive you can't be a passive observer. You know whatever that whatever that even means. Um, and I think what you've also also done is offer a great rationale for why philosophy it's a pity you know when I, I i have a double academic career um i was pursuing a phd in philosophy and one in film studies 
And about the time I was finishing in philosophy, they were closing departments. I mean, that, you know, it, it, it's like, how can that be? This is such an enabling, an enabling set of discourses. Um, um, like what a, what a, what a motive to sort of what a what an argument to get this back into our academic agendas to to have people think not about the thing but about the kind of drivers and contexts and indeed relations that under undergird these things. So I think it's I think it's really fundamental to um, these systems in particular. Again, it, it helps to distinguish them from that center to periphery delivery system. It's something you know. It's something that um, in a more sociological way, someone like uh, James Carey, uh, professor of journalism at Columbia, what, when he was alive, uh, has written about in this, what he saw as a, the side of communication. That, so communication tends to be talked about as transmission. So it's very much that kind of object artifact side of things, getting a message from point A to point B. Indeed, they embrace engineering, Shannon Weaver model. This comes from telephone engineering. Let's get the packet from here to there. Where's the noise? And let's mitigate the noise. You know, And Carrie says, well, whoa, 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 there's another side to this. And that side is ritual. And ritual is actually not just that the sports is always on the last page or the weather is always at the end of the newscast because there will be a tomorrow, no matter how dismal the news. It's not just those packeting formats. It's um, ritual is is what we do with this stuff that we talk about a coffee machine that we start our day with it that we share information with one another that we combine i read the times you read the guardian and we combine our stories to try to figure out with one another what's happening it's the social lived relational side of of the communication process and just as you know as if we needed evidence that this is the case um that this is really important and in fact more important than ever now that our technologies have, uh, require it um again a thing i've written about but it's it's such a vivid illustration in 2014 bezos buys the washington post and the post is really worth something like 60 million of, of a 250 million dollar deal the post itself the best content packet that gets transmitted from point a to point b is worth 60 million and Zuckerberg buys WhatsApp the same year for 19 billion with a B. And what's WhatsApp? Well, it's relations, but there's like no content. It's just like a network of potentials of it's relational. It's purely relational and with nothing else. And it's worth 19. So that just, you know, just says as, as, as loud and clear as you can say it, that we have entered a domain. We have entered a, a, a technological moment where the relational is the thing that has value. And, Okay, that's not that we should throw away the content at all. It's not to say it's an either or, but it is to say this is a side we really have to think about, and it needs it needs to be under. And, and we don't quite. I mean, I think you've offered a great way to kind of locate it philosophically as part of a a long term endeavor to think to think about the relational. But we don't. I don't think we understand what socially speaking yet. Just looking at the kind of kind of odd, odd patterns across the world, not just, I mean, the U.S., we have a lot of stories we could tell, but you could go to the Philippines or Turkey or, you know, pick pick your country, Hungary, and 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 very similar phenomena are occurring, which, which point to a, I don't think we've yet figured out how to manage this relational, uh, these new relational dynamics required and yet not fully understood mm. of our new systems. Yeah, for sure. We're in a networked era, that's for sure. Um, well, just to kind of wrap things up, I'm curious what you think the ultimate potential of all these, you know, immersive storytelling technologies might be and what they might be able to enable. Well, I'll tell you where I think we're headed with these with these story uh, systems. I think we're, you know, we've seen like two extremes. We've seen the the sort of long term, like fixed, the linear fixed story. And we're fine. We're, we through interactivity, we're in a space of pick and choose and like find our way, deploy our agency, hopefully even reflect upon our agency in the process. What I see emerging fast is, um, is a third way that's not necessarily a good way, but a third way, and that is um, recursive narrative systems that that basically do what, what Google already does, but do it in a narrative way, which is to say, track our past behaviors, kind of we know what your likes and dislikes are. We know what you tend to do. 
watch our watch our biometrics, track our biometrics, and path us through a story accordingly. So take an interactive story world, a branch narrative, Bandersnatch, the the Black Mirror episode. Take that thing with its one so supposed one trillion various options, and the system will watch us and track us through based on where our eyes, where we're looking, what, what our pupillary dilation is like, uh, what our EEG, whatever the biosensors are, path us through that. So experientially, we're getting a linear narrative, a fixed linear narrative, but in fact, one that's so-called made to measure. But that made to measure is both something that we've contributed and something the system has contributed. That's a slippery new space. It's a very interesting space. It'll be an incredibly fun place uh, placed space to play in, but it's one that's really a fraught space because the question is what's happening to agency. Um, because these sensors and these, and these algorithmic systems are not, you know, there's no way they're simply amplifying what I feel they're reading and they're interpreting what they think I feel and merging it with the optimization, whatever the optimization systems, uh, are that are hardwired into the, into the, uh, into the algorithm. So that's a really fraught space because I think, you know, right now we're in a world where some people, uh, my, my sense anyway, is that some folks, a lot of people like linear narratives, like to sit down in front of the TV or go to a movie theater. And a bunch of those people are put off by even games, but let alone interact. Having to make choices is not always a, it's a, it's an almost Brechtian thing where you're pulled back from the narrative. You have to make this new way, this third way will solve that but it solves it in a way that I think tampers with agency in a, in a, in a potentially problematic way, but that's where I think we're headed. Hmm. Nice. And is there, is there anything else that's left unsaid that you'd like to say to the broader immersive community or the doc lab community? Congratulations on 15 fantastic years. I can't wait to, can't wait to see what the next 15 bring. Um, no, it's, it's just been a joy. It's been a, a thought leader in the sector, and uh, I can't wait to see what next year brings if we can really be together in person uh, in Amsterdam. Awesome. Well, William, so, uh, thank you so much for for joining us today to be able to kind of unpack not only your journey into this space and kind of reflecting on the past. There's this uh, Kierkegaard quote that talks about how, you know, the you know, life can only be understood by looking backwards, but it has to be lived forwards. So I like that kind of idea of, you know, understanding the historical context that allows us to sort of understand, you know, where we might be going in the future. So, um, yeah, just thanks for for coming on and sharing both these kind of uh, pointers to different theoretical perspectives and kind of reflecting on the different philosophical implications of it all. And uh, yeah, thanks for uh, for joining us today on the podcast. Kent, thank you very much. Bye bye.